Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the concept of software programming. That's the notion of the code that you put into the hardware of a machine. The hardware of the machine is all those transistors and vacuum tubes and circuits and wires and cables that are in a fixed position. The code is just the instruction set, something you type up and you just send into the computer using punch tape or any other entry method. And that tells a computer what operations to perform. That's particularly important when it comes to the idea of a general purpose computer, like Ada Lovelace talked about in the 1840s. If it's going to be a general purpose computer, it's got to be able to shift all the tasks that it does. She even said it would do music and art and pictures as well as mathematical numbers. To do all that, you have to change the instructions for how it operates. And it, of course, gets expressed 100 years later in the 1930s by Alan Turing who says, we don't need to have an infinity of different machines doing different jobs. In other words, a machine to break the code, a machine uh, to do the missile trajectories, a machine to try to calculate explosions. A single machine will suffice, he said. And that was the idea in his mind of the universal computing machine that he wrote about. The engineering problem of producing various machines for various jobs is replaced by the office work of programming the universal machine to do these jobs. Now, uh, most of the machines, or almost all of the computers built in the early 1940s that we've talked about during World War II were single purpose machines whether it was the, um, even the ENIAC was mainly done to do missile trajectories. Uh, Enigma, uh, the Colossus that broke the Enigma code in Bletchley Park, that was its main function. Now I did say that ENIAC was the first programmable computer. In other words, it was there, it was made to do missile trajectories, but you could reprogram it. So he could do explosions or weather or calculate other things. That reprogramming, however, wasn't all that easy. It meant plugging and unplugging all sorts of cables. You had to have a diagram of all the circuits. And when you wanted to reprogram it to do something different, it would take almost you know, six or seven hours uh, to reprogram it. It was a job that the women did, the women of ENIAC we'll talk about in a next lecture. Uh, and it was because partly that the men thought the hardware was the most important thing. You know, boys with their toys. But the women were given what they considered, what the men considered to be clerical work, which was figuring out the software, how to reprogram it. Well, the person who really comes up with the notion of how to reprogram easily a general purpose computer, not by plugging in all those wires and cables and then replugging them, was a wonderful, salty woman named Grace Hopper. She was born on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and her mother was a mathematician. And so she followed in her mother's footsteps and became a mathematician, went to Vassar, got her PhD in Yale. Now, that was in the 1930s, and you think, well, that's a pretty unusual path. But no, Ada Lovelace and her mother were mathematicians. Grace Hopper and her mother were mathematicians. In fact, more women got doctorates in math during the 1930s than 20 years later in the 1950s. So Grace Hopper is teaching, teaching at Vassar, uh, teaching mathematics, and Pearl Harbor happened. And she decides she's got to enter the fray. It's going to change her life. So she does, you know, what uh, moves her, which is she divorces her husband, leaves her husband, joins the Navy at age 36. And she's sent up to Massachusetts to be in midshipman school. And she graduates first in her class from midshipman school and becomes Lieutenant Grace Hopper of the Navy. Now she thought she was gonna be sent 
to do coding, cryptography, like at Bletchley Park, but in the United States. There were a lot of naval facilities that were trying to figure out how to break the German codes and how to do cryptography. Instead, the Navy assigned her to report to Harvard University to work on the Mark I. As I said, the Mark I was, uh, the, was designed and built and, uh, by Howard Aiken, and Howard Aiken had joined the Navy. And he comes back to Harvard in 1944 and convinces Harvard and convinces the Navy that his machine should be a naval facility so that the Harvard deans didn't have too much control over it. And so as you see, there's everybody on his team who are commissioned officers in the US Navy. And next to him is Grace Hopper, the one woman on his team. Uh, Aiken gave Grace Hopper, as soon as she arrived, a copy of Charles Babbage's memoirs, a copy of the notes on the analytical engine that Ada Lovelace had written about Babbage's uh, analytical engine. And he even gave her some of the gears uh, from the uh, difference engine that Charles Babbage's son had sent to Harvard and that Howard Aiken had found in the attic of their building. So there's Grace in her office. And if you see behind her in the bookshelf there or in the shelves there, there's one of the cogs and wheels of Babbage's original difference engine. And in some ways, Howard Aiken there on the far left and uh, Grace Hopper become the modern day uh, counterparts of Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. In fact, they almost thought of themselves that way. They really, and, and, and um, Grace Hopper became a deep devotee of Ada Lovelace and even wrote notes on the Mark I that were somewhat modeled on Ada Lovelace's notes on the analytical engine she had done on Babbage's machine. And uh, with her salty style and commanding presence, she's able to hold her own with the other midshipmen and naval personnel who were at Harvard running the Mark I. Among the little things, uh, amusing things that she did, she keeps a log and one day they can't figure out why one of the relays doesn't seem to be working. There's some problem in the machine and they discover a mark that's caught in one of those click, click, click relay switches. And she puts it in the log and she says, first actual case of a bug. Uh, and so she popularizes through this, the notion of a computer bug and how to debug a computer. Uh, by the time she finished with it, the Mark I by 1945, thanks to Grace Hopper, was the most easily programmable computer in the world. They could switch tasks simply by getting a whole new instruction set. You can see the paper tape rather than having to reconfigure the cables like they had to do uh, with the ENIAC machine down at Penn. Uh, the difference though was that the Mark I at Harvard used electromechanical switches. In other words, those switches that would click on and off. A few of them were electromagnetic, but they didn't use vacuum tubes the way uh, ENIAC was being built down at Penn. Sometimes when you're innovative, you also get stubborn. And Grace Hopper and Howard Aiken, the two of them, got very stubborn about the notion of using physical click clacking electromechanical switches because they thought they were more reliable than vacuum tubes. Indeed, they were more reliable. And when Hopper and Aiken go down to Penn to see ENIAC, they disparage ENIAC for not being easily reprogrammable and not being so reliable. However, it took, uh, uh, could execute uh, about three or four commands per second, uh, the Mark I could, whereas ENIAC could do 5,000 commands per second. And so in the end, obviously, the vacuum tube and then eventually the transistor that replaces it makes computers all electronic and work real fast. And once again, with the ENIAC and that uh, 
very fast machine that they were building at Penn, it was a group of women, who we'll talk about in the next lecture, who figures out the concept of programming. Thanks.